ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and co-parents of all ages, this podcast is for you. Introducing in the center ring, the amicable divorce expert, Judith Weigel. Are you biologically designed for lasting relationships? This is such an excellent topic for this podcast, but I need to give you a little background on how I met our guest, Anastasia Mahanova, really kind of a fluke way. I was listening to my very favorite morning show, driving to work at 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning on K-Rock, K-R-O-Q in Los Angeles. And there's one brilliant, brilliant comedians, one of the best shows I've ever listened to. And there's a woman named Allie Johnson as one of the four co-hosts. And she does a little segment called ADD News, which I find very funny. On this segment a couple weeks ago, she introduced an article in the post on this topic. I was fascinated. I emailed Allie. She sent me the link. I read the article and found Anastasia. And here we are today. Thank you, Anastasia, for joining us. I'm super excited to be here and tell you more about the research and kind of the background in relationship science and genetics. And who would think that there is a relationship between biology and emotion and psychology? But just to let you know that Anastasia is a professor, assistant professor, professor, assistant Assistant professor, assistant professor at the University of Arkansas. And it was just my good fortune that I was able to find you. So Anastasia, would you please introduce to our audience this study to which I'm referring? Yes. So I, as a researcher, am always interested in plugging in the biology to the psychology. And one of the ways that I was interested in examining this is looking at what helps some people sustain their relationship satisfaction when they're newly married. And so we know that when people get married, they are really motivated. They want to say, I do forever. But we know that some couples are losing that satisfaction are becoming dissatisfied. And so our research program in the lab where I was doing my PhD research was specifically interested at looking at newlywed couples and kind of predicting or understanding why some couples became less satisfied versus other couples were able to be more satisfied. And my role in the lab was always saying, oh, what about this? And so in this case, I was reading about this gene um, called CD38 that is um, said to be potentially associated with the release of oxytocin or the amount of oxytocin that people might release in different situations. So oxytocin is um, is a hormone, is a neuropeptide that's associated with bonding. And so immediately this piqued my attention because bonding is essential for romantic relationships. And so there was one study that showed that this particular gene and a particular one small corner, one small piece of this gene was associated with the gratitude that people felt toward their partner. And we decided to examine more broadly what sorts of positive relationship processes, gratitude and extending beyond gratitude might be connected to the differences people have on this gene. So you, first of all, let me explain that oxytocin is not Oxycontin. It's easy to get the two confused, but we are talking about two radically different things. Okay, second, when you're talking about the gene CD38, would you move into, what are these subsets called? Chromosomes, where there's this genetic code that starts you off on your ability to have better relationships and to feel gratitude. So people have many chromosomes, and on one chromosome, there's this gene called CD38. And in this gene, there's a bunch of different um, kind of nucleotides. They make up that whole portion of the gene. And for this study, we zoomed in on just one particular part Um, It has a fancy scientific name of RS37968636, but all that does is tell you where to look on the gene 
for the particular aspect we're interested in. So everyone has the spot, you, me, all of the listeners, we all have this. And we either have an A nucleotide there or a C nucleotide there. And so we call these people, people with an A allele, if you have an A nucleotide in that spot, or people with a C allele, people who have a C nucleotide at that spot. And so everyone has two. So people can have a CC, an AA, or a mix, so an AC. And the past research has shown that the CC people were the ones, the two, the people with the two copies of the C allele were the ones who were displaying more gratitude. Okay, so I will further say, because I just kept reading about this, you sent me so many different papers and studies, and I really dug in. I dug in because, well, first of all, divorce is my business. Second, 50% of first marriages end in divorce. 60% of second marriages end in divorce. And 70% of third marriages end in divorce, which has always fascinated me. So A, I do get repeat business from people who file for divorce that go into second and third divorces. And I always wondered why. Are these people just loving relationships so they're more courageous than me, (laughs) than I am courageous, and they keep trying relationships Are they picking the wrong relationships? And then after I was introduced to your study, I thought, wait a minute, maybe we are set up biologically to be very careful about relationships. Maybe we need to know more about ourselves. So I'm looking at, of course, the ultimate is CC. If our two little little parts of the chromosomes are are, are we're to take seriously, and then you're kind of screwed if you're AA. Although you say that's not true in your study, it's just AA people have a much harder time and have to pay more attention to gratitude. But you also went into two other what we call emotions, and that is trust and forgiveness. So how did you fold in trust and forgiveness with this chromosomal type to gratitude and how are we supposed to process and deal with this? So the original research that really inspired the study only looks at gratitude. And gratitude is one kind of positive way that we can feel about our partner. And so I thought about what are some other positive ways that we can feel our, towards our partner? Well, we can trust our partner and we can forgive our partner when they inevitably might do something that is either annoying or um, deal breaking. Yeah. (laughs) Tragic. Yes. Well, on the other side, it might just be slightly annoying. (laughs) And so um, always the optimist, Anastasia, please continue. (laughs) And so we were wondering whether this gene was just about gratitude or whether it extends to kind of these other positive processes. And so in the newlywed couples that we had, we got everyone's genotype so we could figure out if they were CC or AA or AC. We didn't split those two groups apart because we didn't have really enough people. So we just compared someone who has no A allele, so they're just CC, or someone who has at least one copy of the A allele. And so You worked with 71 couples, right? We had 71 couples, and so we were able to get DNA from 139 people. For three of the people, we couldn't get that. So Anastasia, um, talk about how you executed this logistically. I, I'm reading here that um, within the first three months of the wedding, that's when you brought them on to the project? Yes. So we, we recruited them all within the first three months of marriage. After screening procedures and telling everyone about the study, couples filled out questionnaires that included things like how grateful do you feel to about your partner? How um, trusting are you? How much do you forgive your partner? How satisfied are in your ma- are you in your marriage? And so they filled that out in a questionnaire, and then they came to the lab. And in the lab, we asked them to provide a saliva sample, and we used the saliva sample to get their DNA, and we link those their DNA to their answers. And interestingly, we also follow the people for the first three years of marriage every four months and ask them about their marital satisfaction at each of those time points. 
So not only were we able to kind of look at the very beginning of marriage and how happy did people say they were, but we were able to track these couples for 10 different assessments to see how the pattern of happiness may be different for the people who are CC or AA or AC. How did you find the 71 couples? So we recruited broadly. We used Facebook advertising. We, we contacted people based on marital licenses. So we used pretty standard procedures for this line of work to just try to tell everyone around that we were available um, and that we were interested in newlywed couples who wanted to participate in the study, earn some money, help us learn about relationships. And we, the whole study had 120 couples, but we, um, a little bit on our end, we didn't know what to do with the samples first. And so we were only able to have these 72 couples for these studies or for these analyses. Did the random sample come from around the country? Was it socioeconomic? Was it different cultural backgrounds? So this, these were people who were living around Tallahassee, Florida at the time, because that is where we were doing research at Florida State University. What so year? I'm, so, I'm sorry to interrupt. What year was this? Um, you know, I can't remember off the top of my head. We finished the study maybe in 2018. And so I imagine that we started the study maybe in 2013-14. If I had to guess, but it might have been earlier than that. Uh, I was okay. I was involved towards the end. All right, very good. Go ahead. And so um, these couples came into the lab, and we kind of got this DNA. And then when we looked at the data, it showed that the couples who were the people, the individuals who had the CC genotype, so they had no A alleles. They were more grateful, so we were able to replicate the past research, but we also showed that they had higher gratitude, high, or I said gratitude, higher trust, higher forgiveness, and they were more satisfied in that newlywed period uh, within the first three months of their wedding. And so we were able to do some somewhat complicated statistics to show whether the effect of this gene on marital satisfaction was due to gratitude, forgiveness, or trust. And in that statistic model, it showed that trust was really the main player there that explained why the gene was related to marital satisfaction. So it was related to um, gratitude, forgiveness, and to trust, but its relationship with trust is why it kind of bolstered that marital satisfaction. You know, I am fascinated, of course, with all three of these aspects, gratitude, forgiveness, and trust. Trust, first of all, again, because of my line of business and people who listen to this podcast, trust is a big issue in keeping relationships together. And then when the trust is broken down, typically the relationship goes away. They may try to repair. Some are successful, some are not. So when you said trust is really the cornerstone, I got it. Is socioeconomic background um, important in this? If people have less money versus more money, does this make a difference in trust and forgiveness and gratitude? So the sample that we had tended to be pretty much all middle class, middle upper class. We weren't really able to get a full range of socioeconomic status to really dive into that. But I do know that that's an important question for us to examine in future studies because what we know sometimes is good or bad in kind of more wealthy couples is actually good. So if it's a bad thing that is that we know from research on more wealthy couples, we've actually found the complete opposite to where it tends to be protective for couples who are dealing with more financial struggles. Can you give so, me an ex a specific example? How does it play out in real life? Yeah, so one such pattern that we thought as relationship scientists, we've thought for decades has been bad, is this pattern called the man withdraw, where one partner, and in this research, most often the wife, um, has increasing demands. And the husband, um, usually, again, this pattern could happen in any context, but usually in these studies, the husband tends to withdraw. And so this pattern of demand withdraw has been linked to negative relationship consequences, negative relationship processes, but only when we were studying 
um, upper class couples and kind of um, middle class, upper class, fairly wealthy couples without too many worries about resources. But some recent research has dived, dived into studying this in um, lower socioeconomic status couples and actually found that that was good. Those couples were able to weather some of the bumps in their relationship much better. And so we're still investigating how or why this might exist. And I didn't do that research. I was just so excited about that lab's research. I want to tell people about it. Um, but so we, we are still learning so much about how people's socioeconomic status can actually affect the dynamics of relationships we think we understand. So in my mind, there may be two things going on. There may be what you just said, um, satisfaction, gratitude, et cetera, being a little different in lower economic versus higher economic couples. But I do know, and we can throw this into your research for the next project, I do know that money, finance, the ability to earn money, the ability to keep the family afloat, the, uh, the, the way people use money, do they go into debt? Do they overspend? Do they stay within their budget? You know, that's the A number one reason why people get divorced. It's not adultery. That comes very close behind. But because we need money to live, we need to trust that each spouse is responsible in the way they handle money. And I don't think that matters. I think you can be wealthy and misuse money, just like you can have less money and misuse money or spend it wiser. So I think that that would be an interesting thing for you to look at, just because this is what I live with um, in the divorce field. I wanted to ask you another question. Is there any difference in gender when you're looking at CC versus AC versus AA? So men and women have an equal chance of having either of these combinations. And that was the case for our study as well. And the link between the gene and gratitude, forgiveness, trust, and marital satisfaction was the same for the husbands and wives in our study. And so, and in our study, everyone was heterosexual, but at this point, we have no reason to believe that this would be any different for people who are in non-heterosexual or even non-monogamous relationships because it was such a universal link in our study. And so for us, if you as a person had a CC genotype, you tended to have an easier time with gratitude, trust, and forgiveness, and you tended to say that you were happier at the three month mark of your marriage. And those people tended to also be happier at three years into marriage. So they kind of stayed elevated throughout the whole time that we were monitoring their feelings. Now, this is very unscientific of me, this next thing that I'm going to say, but I have made an observation. Starting with myself and my own marriage, I was married eight years, very amicable divorce, I have to say that, still friendly with my ex-husband, but I divorced after eight years. I That I'm in the divorce business. Many years later, I'm in the divorce business, and I like to talk to people. Once the divorce is over, people actually open up more and talk once we get all the filing together. So this is what I wanted to share, and I wanted to get your take on this. My observation was that the wedding night and the honeymoon either make or break your uh, confidence that you made the right decision getting married. So we all know that people know going into the wedding day that they may not have made the right decision, yet they still go through with it thinking it's wedding jitters. And I... We did have difficulty on the honeymoon, although we had a really great time leading up to all of that. And as I talk to more and more couples in my divorce business, I understand that a lot of people had their gut feeling was not good about proceeding or when I used to, oh, in my former career, uh, booking music for private events and 
weddings in Los Angeles. And when you're doing weddings in Beverly Hills and Bel Air, you're talking about an enormous amount of money. I mean, more money than people spend on homes. That's what they spend on their uh, weddings. And I could tell when people came in, just the way they made decisions on music, I could tell whether they were going to be divorced or not within a few years. And I was generally right, especially if they came back for a second wedding. Then I knew I was right. So I wanted to know why you decided to start at the beginning. Maybe an obvious answer, but I still would like to hear it. Why in the research... Did the scientists decide to start at the very beginning within the th- first three months and end it after three years? Well, part of that is logistics and part of that is on purpose. So on purpose, the newlywed period, so after couples get married, actually does give an insight into some of the things that go wrong because some of the reasons that people divorce are present at the very beginning. So kind of like you said, they're present right in the beginning. So we can capture that within the first three months. And so studying the newlywed period is important because we can try to identify and understand those processes. Now, from the practical side of things, when we get grant money, it's for three years. So why do we follow couples for three years? It's because we can get money for three years. Okay, so that's so practical, so realistic. Thank you for that. And for why three months after? Because it's a little easier to recruit couples right after they get married. I would love to do a study on couples that are engaged and follow them through the process. But right now we tend to, we've kind of focused on the newlywed period. And so I think that as you're kind of talking, capturing that transition and maybe those jitters, might also provide a lot of insight. We just haven't really understood that period yet, and I'm hoping to be able to look at that sometime in the future. It is fascinating, in general, how people do not trust their gut, and they do not acknowledge behavior in front of them. They want to form and shape the person that they've chosen or would like to have in their life as the right person. And so they'll set up all these different reasons, but it's so not sustainable once you get into the relationship. And um, I like the fact that, of course, you only get research money for three years, but I also think from being in this business, it really is a good amount of time to study people because you, you can only... You can only put a Band-Aid on the wound, that emotional wound of, oh my gosh, I chose the, right, the wrong person for so long, unless you culturally, religiously cannot get divorced. That's very difficult. And you find that in some cultures as well. You, it's, it's just very difficult to get divorced. So um, I think those first three years are right just from my perspective too. Can I sneak in um, another study that is not related to my research, but is from one of my co-authors, um, Dr. James McNulty, uh, Jim McNulty, also at Florida State, and one of his graduate students. They actually looked at the gut feelings that people have about their partner. And uh, Dr. McNulty's research shows that people don't want to say to the researchers, to themselves, what those gut feelings might be. Um, when you give people a survey about how happy they are and it's a one to seven scale, people just circle seven. They don't want to admit to themselves or to their researcher often that they might not have some of those positive gut feelings. But there's ways to assess those gut feelings using other techniques. But where I wanted to say is kind of what you said with the jitters and attributing that negative gut reaction to the situation and not to the person. They're one of their recent findings suggest that people have these negative gut associations with their partner, but they say it's their mood and not their relationship. So they were able to show that in kind of a diary, the couple, the people who said, who had this negative association with their partner were saying their relationship is fantastic, but their mood is bad. And so they were able to pick up on this, but they explained it in a way that kind of protected their evaluation of their relationship. And so I think um, the research in relationship science would support your kind of 
um, what you've picked up on it years in the business and talking to people. It doesn't surprise me what you said about how they respond to that question of how satisfied are you. People do want to assign it um, other reasons than, I just think I picked the wrong person. doesn't mean the person's a bad or horrible person. They're just not right for you. And, you know, the way I, of course, talk to everybody who walks through the doors of my office is divorce is a learning lesson. Don't beat yourself up. Certainly don't make yourself a victim, um, an emotional victim, and and don't blame the other person. If we can get away from that and just use this as a learning experience, then maybe we can with a different point of view, a different eye, um, get into a better relationship. But here's what I am wondering from you, if maybe we should start a new, a new approach to marriage. Should we all get DNA tests so that we can see if we're CC, AC, or AA before we get married? Mm. Short answer, no. (laughs) Um, That's partly because you can't look at someone and know whether they are AA or CC. And the same level of gratitude can come to you from a partner who is AA and CC. So the things that we look at is one contribution to someone's level of gratitude. The genes are one of the contributions. But a whole other set of very important contributions are people's childhoods, people's life experiences. So the gene is not the only thing that determines someone's level of gratitude. And if you only focus on that small chunk, then you miss the rest of your partner, the rest of them as a whole person. And so I would caution people from like running and DNA testing their partner and deciding that they will be ungrateful. But what this study does tell us is that perhaps for some people, it's a little bit easier to be showing gratefulness and feeling trust and um, and forgiving their partner. So if they have this particular gene, it might be easier for them. And so I think the takeaway from this research isn't necessarily to drag your partner to get DNA tested, but maybe more to look at the importance of these traits um, and these feelings. So showing gratitude, um, showing trust, feeling trust and forgiveness, And I think if anything, it can help people maybe pinpoint something that maybe isn't going as well for them and their marriage. So if they identify these as a problem, they can maybe think about like, okay, maybe I'm a person who this doesn't come easy for. Maybe I need to put a little bit more conscious effort in order to improve my marriage by focusing conscious, my conscious attention on the gratitude, trust and forgiveness piece. And so again, everyone has different strengths and weaknesses. And if we know that maybe our automatic instinct is to not show and feel this gratitude, people can make a conscious effort to um, kind of embrace gratitude more. Um, And maybe, you know, over time, that conscious effort will make it become more intuitive for them. And so I think that the, the takeaway from my research should be to understand that there are all of these components, including genetic components, that can make certain processes and relationships easier or harder for people. Okay. So not to drag your partner to the DNA clinic, but for both of you to go there. So here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking that to know thyself as much as you can is always a good thing. So there are people that are just naturally jealous, naturally distrusting. So your point is very well taken in in terms of background. So maybe they come from a home where one of their parents was unfaithful to their other parent. And so learned behavior, they learn to be a little more protective, maybe they go a little bit farther into um, needing trust to be supported by their other partner. But I'm kind of thinking, you know, maybe knowing our genetic makeup isn't such a bad deal. I mean, we have to know when we're type two, di- type two diabetics, 
you don't take insulin for that, but it's really good to know that because then you regulate your eating. And so I'm thinking, because I love your research, I love this project, I'm so fascinated by this, that biology and emotion are linked together. I, I, I'm, you know, I, I still, when I, when I think about this, I'm completely fascinated. Um, so let's go to the idea that biology and emotion are actually connected. Can you help explain why this is? Well, our head is not floating above our body without any connections. So our, our brain is both monitoring the physiological, biological side, and our brain also contributes to the emotions and the thoughts that we have. So it's kind of like a central hub. And for a lot of people, they think that biology is only in the like basic processes. Like, yeah, I get hungry, that's biology. But the feelings I have and the thoughts I have, that's not biology. But in reality, it's you're all one person. All of that is connected. And so for me personally, connecting those dots, connecting the things that are happening in people's bodies and how their brain may be reacting to it to affect different ways that they perceive their partner's actions is, for example, interesting to me. It may not be interesting to other people, but for me, that's what makes me uh, excited. No, I think this is very interesting to most people who want to have relationships, maybe even to those people who shy away from relationships too. But no, this is so very exciting. All right. Gratitude, forgiveness, trust. Three of the cornerstones that make up a lasting relationship. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in our significant others. It can be in friends. It can be in siblings. It can be in uh, parental child relationships. It can in employer employee relationships. And, right? Any relationship at all. These are the cornerstones. Okay. So when we were talking previous to this, um, yes, the study started with looking at gratitude and then moved into trust and forgiveness. Are there, is there a priority status to these three emotions in, uh, for relationships? So research suggests that these are very important. So we know that trust is very central. Um, we've shown that in several, so not me, but again, the field has really emphasized that trust is important. And when I say trust, I don't mean jealousy because we actually found that this gene wasn't related to jealousy. And so it seems to be capturing something, maybe like you were saying, just trusting your partner to make good decisions about finances or to, um, to help you, to protect you, whatever, whatever trust might mean to the person. And so it seems to capture that, not necessarily just focusing on the adultery piece. And so for some reason, this idea of like when, when you ask people, how much do you trust your partner? That captures something important to the way that people evaluate their relationship. And gratitude is very important as well, especially if both people show and feel gratitude. So if it's just one person, that's not that great. It's almost um, the same as having no one show gratitude. But if both people, if both people show gratitude, we see that that leads to more, more relationship satisfaction and less decline. And so I think that these are very important pieces. But, and, and correct me if I'm wrong um, in, in the way I processed our, our former conversation. I think you said no relationship can survive without forgiveness. Did I get that wrong or right? Forgiveness is super important because every relationship will have conflict and disagreements. And so you do have to solve them and forgive your partner. I think you're spot on that that is something that is essential in every relationship because you might disagree on what to eat for dinner so that's a small disagreement and you might have a conflict over where to move for work and so all conflict or rather all of the different types of conflict if you want to be in a relationship you will have some of those conflicts and like you were saying that's the same in our relationships with our family and with our friends anyone that we're interconnected with 
because we have to make a decision and people might have different opinions. And so forgiveness and being able to navigate conflict is very important because conflict is a part of every relationship. It really is. And it's the thing about the relationship that can really make it tighter and stronger because through conflict, you need to assess what's going on with each person, how they look at things. And when that can be done amicably, you really can keep growing and growing in in the closeness of your relationship. So conflict is not horrible. It's how you handle conflict. That makes a difference. I also had in my notes that trust is the happiness influencer. So that's what I was talking about in our statistical model. Trust was the piece that was associated with marital satisfaction. And so for for the couples that we were following, that we were studying, trust was the part that linked the gene to marital satisfaction. You know, I it, it, again, trust in, in any relationship is extremely important. It, it's, it's our safety net, that feeling of trust, um, of I have nothing to worry about. My partner has my back. My manager has my back. My mother has my back. Sister, whatever, has my back. It was never so obvious to me as when the pandemic hit last year. And we all have our routines. We all have our places to go each day, whether it, you know, work and then home, uh, school for the kids. We all have our routines. And all of a sudden, our routines were dramatically changed. And I noticed in me, my trust of the world of people in charge of different aspects of my life, I had a hard time with that. The news media, I had a hard time if they weren't consistently right about what they were telling me. And then you had all the doctors that came on. And so trust is such an important concept. And I think we experience trust in every single aspect of our lives. And I'm wondering, Anastasia, if those of us, hopefully I have CC, AC, I will be devastated if I have AA, and you know I'm running to the DNA clinic after this episode is done. Um, I wonder if our reaction to something like the pandemic um, is it is a result of how our genetic makeup is even what do you think i think that this definitely goes beyond people's romantic relationships so other research has connected the cc genotype to college students reporting kind of better um, like less feeling of alienation from their peers So not feeling as alienated from the people around them. And so it seems like the CC genotype probably has effects broadly. And what we don't know is how do people with the CC versus AA genotype react to this dramatic shift, right? So if people were very well connected to their peer networks, to maybe a romantic partner that they didn't live with um, before the pandemic and then the pandemic hit, they, I think everyone experienced a lot more alienation than they would normally because they were so disconnected. And so what we don't know is maybe the people with the CC genotype were able to weather that better because they sustained some of those processes. Or maybe for them, the process is so important, they had a more difficult time. I think that that is something that we don't yet know the answer to. And I'm secretly hoping someone looks at that. <laughs> Good. Uh, and so I think that there's also this importance of like, if trust is so important to you, does that mean that you sustain trust in the face of a big, big change or a big stressor? Or do you react to the loss of those connections stronger? And so that's something that I think is at this point unclear. But what is clear is when these people feel trust, they feel really good about their relationship. And I think you hit the nail on the head that this would be something with one's 
my spouse, one's best friend, maybe one's boss. So I think that this could affect people across the different domains in their life. So Anastasia, in conclusion, what should people get? What should our listeners get from this discussion um, and their relationships, their, their, their intimate relationships? So one thing at the very, very basic level, I hope that people understand and get excited about is the fact that we do have a link between the biology and the psychology of our relationships. Because I think that being able to understand and process not just our conscious experiences, but try to understand that there might be other non-conscious experiences and influences that affect our relationships. I think that that is both... um, provides people with clarity and maybe some empowerment, depending on how people frame it. And I also hope that people take away that trust, gratitude, and forgiveness are very important to sustaining marital satisfaction. And not that you should uh, give up on being grateful and trusting if you have the AA or AC genotype, (laughs) but, (laughs) but that you realize that that might be something that comes less naturally and when you're motivated to maintain your relationship um, or future relationship, that that might be something that you can consciously pay attention to. So if you're a person who doesn't show, maybe feels gratitude, but doesn't show gratitude so often or has a tendency to get caught up in their own stressors and not devote as much attention to noticing the nice things that your partner might do for you, I think that it would be important to recognize that this is actually a very important process and we should kind of stop and reflect on the things that our partners do to kind of help us along in daily life and that this type of gratitude, reflection, forgiveness of the annoying habits and kind of trust that your partner has your back, those are important things to cultivate. And um, even if it doesn't come naturally or maybe comes a little less naturally, that's something that people can definitely improve on. I went to a seminar, a mediation convention seminar about four or five years ago in Los Angeles. And there was a a, a seminar class on why certain relationships last 40, 50, 60 years. There was a divorce attorney and a marriage counselor, uh, both conducting this particular class. And there were videotapes of people in their late 60s, 70s, even early 80s, because as we know, 60 is the new 40. I say this for for my benefit, of course, since I am in the 60s. But point being, all these couples on videotape said the exact same thing. And they didn't know each other. These were different clips taken at different times. They each said the same thing. We did not find our partner's habits annoying at all. We accepted our partners and we were happy to be with them. So, you know, you hear these uh, in sitcoms or, or, or if people are complaining about their partners, it's the logistical day-to-day issues living together that seem to chip away at the relationship, not, not um, washing your dishes. If you've had a meal by yourself, leaving your dishes in the sink, that upsets quite often the other spouse, generally a woman but not always. Men are known to like to clean up too. Leaving the the cap off the toothpaste. And of course, my favorite, the lid of the toilet up or down, depending on who you are, (laughs) which gender you are. And I found that interesting that those daily little activities that chip away at relationships did not exist in lasting relationships. And so where do you think that fits um, in the chromosomal makeup of somebody? Well, I think that, honestly, I think that those people are lying to themselves just a little bit <laughs> uh, because there's probably something their partner does that's annoying. There's no one person who doesn't do anything, but I think it's how they interpret those behaviors. I think that maybe objectively, they might see, oh, they left their tooth, they like squeeze the toothpaste or they leave the calf off or do something that they disagree with. 
but they have a benevolent way of thinking about their partner that kind of gets rid of that annoyance. So they don't dwell on it. And so maybe the forgiveness and the gratitude kind of buffers against that. I don't believe that any person can exist without any annoying habits, but they don't let those things grate on them. Oh, right. No, exactly. The point is we all have annoying habits, but these people were married, you know, 50 and 60 years, and they seemed really happy on camera. Um, So I I was just wondering about that after I I, I read your study and and we talked and and I uh, got more of a feel for this. If I had to guess, maybe those people are easy to move past the annoyances, forgive their partner for whatever little thing it was, and spend more time focusing on the conscious things that their partner does and what makes them feel grateful. So from the perspective of these findings, maybe they kind of forgive more and then focus on other things that their partner is wonderful at. So the annoyances, they just move on so quickly. That's not, they don't, there's no mental real estate focusing on that. They focus more on the positives. You're right. The forgiveness, the forgiveness aspect comes in. You're absolutely right about that. So Anastasia, this is the part of the, of each episode where I typically ask our guests to give uh, contact information because you know, I, I, I'm either interviewing attorneys or authors or therapists, but you're kind of a different animal, so to speak. So I'm thinking because you've written so much, you've done so much research, if people are interested in this topic, how do they find out more about your research? So they can look up my name. <laughs> so there's not a lot of me. So Mahanova is M-A-K-H-A-N-O-V-A. I'm an assistant professor at University of Arkansas. I have several different research pages that list different aspects of the work that I do. And maybe, so this, this article that we're talking about is publicly available to everyone. You don't need to have a subscription to a library or subscription to a journal. Anyone could type in CD38 and bonding relevant cognitions, relationship satisfaction, marriage, those key terms, and Google should get them to this article that's published in Nature Scientific Reports that is free for all to read and access. And you know what? I'm going to have them in my show notes. Uh, There's a blog attached to every episode that I do. And so I'll make sure I get all of this information in the show notes. Anastasia, I really looked forward to this interview. And I cannot tell you how appreciative I am that you've taken the time to do this for us. Uh, thank you so much. I'm super excited. I love sharing the little bits of information I know about biology and relationship science. And so this genetic piece is one of my research interests. I'm also interested in inflammation and immune system and then in testosterone. So, you know, you can have me on later again, talk about some completely different topics. We absolutely could. And by the way, when you were saying that, I thought, well, what if somebody wants to volunteer for a future project with you? Is that something you would be interested in? Yeah, um, my contact information is on the article. So it's and on my webpage. It's not difficult to find. And but the worst case scenario is just not good timing. But I can always keep a list of people who have something interesting to say on the topic and might inspire um, a data analysis. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you again. And thank all of you for listening, as always, to the Amicable Divorce Expert. Please share this episode with your friends. Please subscribe. And if you would like to provide a topic for me to cover, you can reach me through my email address, judith at theamicabledivorceexpert.com, judith at theamicabledivorceexpert.com. And as always, have an amicable day. That's our show for today. Thank you for joining us. Be good to yourselves, be kind to your spouse, and cherish your children above all else. 